Um, this is kind of an unconventional talk for me. People said I should t talk about my career and lessons learned as president of Yale and how, how did I wind up moving from that job to the current one of running Coursera. It's a little uncomfortable talking about myself, actually. I, I was once asked in China at, um, uh, at a conference of university presidents at, at Peking University to talk about presidential leadership. You know, I was the, one of the most senior university presidents, and I was supposed to talk to all these Chinese university presidents about about my experiences, and I completely finessed it by talking instead about the experiences of Charles Eliot, who was the president of Harvard from 1869 to 1909. And I managed to disguise what I had to say about leadership in the form of talking about some someone else. I didn't have time really to prepare such an elegant escape from the subject here, so I'll, I will talk about myself and try to and try to you know give you a sense of some of the lessons learned. So I, I was specifically going to focus on three things. Um, um, why internationalizing Yale was such an important um, part of my work there, and why I thought that was an, an important thing to do for a great American university. Um, and then that will lead kind of naturally to two things. One, one why, why in doing that we had a particular focus on China and, and Asia, and why we looked that across the Pacific rather than the Atlantic principally. Um, for uh, uh, for focus, and then I'll talk a little bit about Yale's evolution into online education, and and then that will help to explain the combination of international focus and online focus in my latter stages of my Yale career, um, help to make it more understandable why I'm doing what I'm doing now, which is running the world's largest um, provider of high quality online education um, for uh, 10 million people around the world. Um, so start starting with internationalizing Yale. Um, in my inaugural address in in uh, October of 1993, um, I highlighted in in ways that I think people didn't quite hear or comprehend at the time the the, uh, the fact that the world was changing because of communications technology. The word globalization had not yet been invented as a, as a catchword at that point. Um, by the way, the internet didn't exist in 1993. It was pretty different. But I pointed out, um, but I pointed out that, the, that the way that the world was coming together was going, to, was, going to, was going to have radically transformative effect on what on what students needed to know to negotiate in a more closely connected world. And in particular, I thought the characteristic of cross-cultural understanding would be critical as a, as a component of the education of anyone who aspired to a position of significance or leadership um, in the world that the students of 1993 were going to enter. Um, I think it was a, you know, I was maybe Five years ahead of Tom Friedman on this point, or something, but but the but the the, um, the, the the I think the point was right and remains right that um, Yale, which has always been it's for three centuries, been a leader in America in sort of educating people for leadership roles in our domestic society, was you know would, would have to operate differently. Um, that that just as you know having good deep intellectual capabilities in, in, um, in being able to read and think critically and be numerate and, and do analytic work, that uh, along with those, those, those cognitive skills, the capacity to enter in, intersubjectively into the point of view of someone who, who was raised in a different culture with different values and different orientations in the world was actually going to be instrumental in in educating people to be successful um, in leadership. I, I got to this actually entirely from self-reflection on my own education, where I spent had two stints of overseas study, one in Italy as an undergraduate, and then as a postgraduate in England. Hardly really exotic places for an American, even in the 1960s, but still, the, uh, it, it, de it deeply affected me that just the, 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 that that um, you know people's assumptions about the way the world works are very different from the world, and you know with a, as in a more highly interconnected world, 
having the capacity to empathize with the point of view of the other and to understand that the uh, uh, that people are coming from things with a different set of assumptions, coming to things with a different set of assumptions would really help one be an effective comprehender and persuader and leader uh, in, in, a, in an interconnected, diverse world. So, uh, to me, international understanding was part of the 21st century education, and I set about to try to make that part of the fabric of Yale. So, how did we do it? Well, first, there's curriculum development. So, we, we put a lot of effort into recruiting faculty and building resource, putting resources behind programs in international studies of all kinds, uh, both uh, both um, in, the, in, the, in the humanities and the social sciences and in the professions. Um, that was, and, and, and of course the curriculum itself, even within a subject, was changing. I thought of my own, my own subject as economics. And, um, you know, when I started teaching um, industrial organization in 1974, the standard course title, believe it or not, for a starting course in industrial organization was the structure, conduct, and performance of American industry. Well, you know, there's no such thing as American industry anymore. But everything is globally competitive. So, so in a way, curriculum became internationalized, at least in the social sciences, by itself. It, was, it didn't. It, I mean, the, the world was changing in such a way that um, the curriculum evolved to reflect it. So. And curriculum was one facet of internationalizing Yale. A second was opening Yale to international students. This is astonishing, but, it, but under the undergraduate portion of Yale, when I started in 1993, less than 2% of the students were from outside the United States. Well, well outside the US, 2% from Canada. Less than 2% from the rest of the world. Staggering. I mean, staggeringly parochial for an institution that even then was recognized as one of the world's best. So, um, so we we set on a track to quintuple that number um, over a period of years, and we have. Um, and one of the principal ways we did it was to be the first American school to offer the standard form of of, of, of financial aid that we offer domestic students, which is essentially fully full. Um, we, we meet the students' full financial need. So Yale, Yale gives as much scholarship, you know, basically estimates what the family can afford to pay, and, and the family can't afford to pay the extremely high sticker price of $55,000. Um, Yale makes up the difference. That is no American institution, that, you know, they were like British institutions are, using the foreigners as cash cows. You know, the foreigners paid full freight, and so you ended up with nothing but wealthy foreigners. That's all gone at Yale now, and, and, and now we are, you know, an avenue of opportunity for the most meritorious students um, from around the world. Um, so, so we change the composition because if you're going to learn how to learn to interact with people from different cultures, you might as well have some right there in your dormitory. And that, that was the, so that was the way we started. Then we created an entire spate of, of uh, new opportunities for students to study and work abroad. And one of the strange things about um, about Yale is that um, nobody likes to leave uh, during the academic year. So whereas many American schools have very large scale junior year abroad programs, this is not a, this this didn't happen at any at any scale at Yale because nobody wants to miss the great experience that they have. If you don't mind me saying so, so so we created a huge number of summer opportunities for students to work as to be work interns or to study languages abroad. We have over 100 students a year studying Chinese in China, actually in Greater China. Some of them study right here um, in Hong Kong, and um, uh, and that and we transformed Yale you know, from a place where you know 10 or 15 percent of our student body was getting an overseas experience to where 80 to 90 percent are now getting. An over I mean, it, it, it's available to everybody um, getting an overseas experience. That was the second major change. Um, the um, uh, the other the other ways of international university international university had plus directly connected to the student experience, but more to the faculty experience of encouraging research collaborations and putting a lot of support behind um, behind those actually establishing a couple of research centers in uh, in China um, in the sciences 
And then finally, um, I, I, we had the thought that since Yale had particularly prided itself on educating leaders, and since we had so few um, um, people, because we educated so few at the undergraduate level up to the, the middle 1990s, that, that, um, that we might as well get a head start on, on having an impact globally by having directly, directly having leadership programs um, for uh, government leaders, university leaders, um, business leaders, um, uh, leaders in other professions from around the world. And so we developed a whole um, number of kind of advanced, short-term, non-degree leadership programs um, that, that can be quite important. Um, China as a particular focus. That's the second point I want to make. Um, it, it seemed to me, even back around the year 2000, that, um, <coughs> that, 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 that in the century ahead, the U.S.-China relationship was going to be the most important international, the, you know, the most important dimension of international um, relations in the world, and that, and that, um, that, that was inevitable. And Yale already had a very good advantage in terms of China um, because of our early history in China um, and the fact that the first Chinese to ever study it abroad came to Yale and then built a foundation that brought a lot of uh, late Qing Dynasty you know, modernizers to Yale in the late 19th century and went back and built the railroads and were the... And were the basically half the cabinet of the first nationalist government and so forth. So there was a lot of history, it was well known, and we, and uh, starting in 2001, we, we, uh, we really dug in and started to develop close ties with lots of Chinese institutions and, and uh, you know, enhance our opportunities for two-way exchanges there. I thought it was really important um, for us, I mean, it was, it was, it was advantageous because it was important to educate Americans about China, but also there's great receptivity in China to, to partnering with us, uh, and we had access to all kinds of opportunities, and particularly the leadership training area, like you see one of my faculty colleagues in the audience from, you know, Howard. Um, uh, so, um, who helped us pioneer some of these early ventures here? Um, Helen Su, who's, I know, a picture in Hong Kong as well as many of them. Um, the, um, uh, one of the one of the programs um, that was particularly interesting to me was uh, uh, was working with Chinese university presidents and party secretaries and vice presidents on Chinese educational reform. And that that program started in about 2005, and we we ran an a annually for uh, eight or nine years sessions with the um, uh, either in New Haven or in China. Um, to sort of um, uh, help with educational reform issues as they arose, um, it was this was it was it was you know in, an interesting period actually in in Asia from the late 1990s or this essentially same time frame where there was a huge investment in upgrade of higher education. Hong Kong was already a little ahead of the rest of Asia, but this is a period in which. You know, Singapore is putting an enormous amount into developing stronger universities, and then China embarks starting in 1998 on this amazingly ambitious project of, you know, quintupling within a few years the number of students in higher education, and and you know, great greatly expanding, essentially doubling the number of universities, um, uh, you know, embarking on a whole project and. And also doing something that you know no European country would dare do, which was actually singling out a handful of universities for special funding to try to make them world class and competitive internationally. Um, uh, interesting that it would be a communist country that would actually decide that Be Beida and Tsinghua were going to get more resources than anybody else and, and become competitive with Harvard and Yale in 20 years. At least that was their dream. Um, the uh, so that was a that was a really interesting opportunity for us to work with uh, with the Ch the Chinese um, institutions as they were embarked on this very ambitious project of expansion, and it was it was um, 
it was interesting how many areas of development were you know needed to be undertaken simultaneously. I mean, faculty hiring. They they you know they, these these schools um, traditionally hired their own, and and even though more increasing numbers would go abroad for study for their PhDs, they would hire back the people that had been undergraduates at their own institutions. They were they were distinctly sub-optimizing in building the quality of their own faculties and. What that was, you know, we, we, one of the things we worked on was how do you recruit faculty, um, and they've done much better, I would say, over the last decade than than they did before. Um, they also started to pay more competitive salaries too, which which was uh, essential. We worked with them on um, uh, curriculum reform, and I, you know, they they started to do many of them started to do just what. Uh, Hong Kong University has now done, which is um, move from an entirely specialized undergraduate curriculum to you know a year of general education, um, followed by a specialized curriculum. That was, um, I think, our program was very uh, instrumental in helping uh, effect that particular reform, uh, uh, and you know it's working with varying degrees of success at, at some of the different. Uh, C9 universities, and uh, I think, you know, on the whole, I think that's probably a change that's going to be enduring. The hardest one, um, the hardest lever to pull in the Chinese universities, and which remains difficult, is pedagogy. Um, because the, the um, you know, getting um, interact, you know, students comfortable with, faculty as well as students comfortable with, a high level of, of interactivity in the classroom as opposed to the kind of passive lecture and listener um, dynamic, um, was, was, very, was very hard. And um, the leadership of the universities recognized that that was an important ingredient. To, if they were going to get to absolute top quality, they needed to have a, a really transform the pedagogy. And that's happening extremely slowly. But it was an interesting, it was, it, that was an interesting lesson. Um, it, that actually, it was, it was that observation about transforming both curriculum and, and particularly pedagogy that, that made it, it very attractive when we were approached at Yale by the National University of Singapore to set up a liberal arts college there along the American model but with a curriculum that was explicitly different and comparative and cross-cultural, but where the style of teaching was very much the small class, highly interactive, you know, encouraging students to think for themselves, um, kind of pedagogy um, that we practice uh, in New Haven. And, um, you know, that Yale and U.S. College is now its second year of operation. And the idea was to really try to create that as a model for Asia, and in particular for China. It seemed, from a political point of view, it was going to be very difficult to pull that off in China um, right away. So Singapore was a Hong Kong would have been a candidate also, but Singapore was a, a, a good place for a laboratory for an institution like that, and it's working really, really well. Um, so that, that, that sort of, that's the sort of internationalization of Yale story. Um, the, the online portion comes in um, sort of also uh, during the course of my Yale presidency. We, we, I, I, I've been attracted to this from very early on, and, Back in 2000, in the sort of first wave of attempts to do online education, um, we, we partnered with Stanford and Oxford, um, not coincidentally, the, the Yale, Stanford, and Oxford being the three schools I attended, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to put courses online. And, and we, you know, we made disastrous mistakes. We thought the market was our collective alumni rather than the world, and so the narrow casting was was a mistake in terms of viability. But also, the technology just wasn't there. The bandwidth was inadequate. You got these kind of jerky videos, you know, the slow that you'd watch a few seconds and then it would pause and then start up again. The little blue wheel would be spinning all the time, and and so we were just we were ahead of the game. But I, I, we saw the potential um, for reaching larger audiences. And so then when the open educational resource movement got going in the middle of the last decade, 
Um, Yale jumped right on the bandwagon just after MIT put up all of its course materials in the open courseware project. We decided we'd make videos of our best lecture courses. So we did 45 uh, Yale College courses. It, just the traditional camera, you know, what, what, the, what, we, what we now call camera capture, uh, classroom capture, basically just just um, just recording what went on in the lecture hall. No um, no editing, nothing nothing special. Uh, no interactive features, and they you know they reached a substantial audience. Uh, you know we put them on iTunes and and uh, and on our own website. <laughs> but nothing like the scale that's possible now with the, with the MOOCs. So, but but we, but we were. I, I was quite convinced that this was a great use of university resources, and consistent with the idea that you know we should be doing something so, socially useful for the whole world, and that you know con to concentrate the incredible resources of a place like Yale just on the the the, 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 the handful of selected, highly selected students we admitted seemed like, to me, a waste of great intellectual resources that we should be reaching for a larger audience. And so that gets me to the transition. So when I stepped down as president of Yale, you know, by the way, had joined Coursera as a partner before that, um, I, I, I had no idea this is what I'd end up, end up doing, but, um, but when the opportunity came about nine months into my so-called retirement, um, I really couldn't resist because I I just think what 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 the MOOC movement and the quality of, of, of the product we now are able to offer with the new newer technology um, is just such an incredible opportunity for universities to do good in the world. Um, so I mean, first of all, MOOCs are di are different from the camera capture. The what what we do at Coursera and what some of the other um, organizations that are online courses up to yes these are produced versions of the courses they're done in a in a studio or or just in front of a desktop computer um, uh, but but you know it's kind of mixed medium with the, the professor talking into the camera for part of the class but with lots of video you know whether they're PowerPoint slides or video animations or straight video footage um, other materials on the screen there's pedagogical secrets that have been unlocked that make that that make these much more compelling than the camera in the classroom, such as interrupting the video every six to ten minutes with a quiz or just something to think about, some some break in the in the rhythm of the lecture. I mean, I'm guilty of it right now, but it turns out that Carl Wyman, the Nobel Prize-winning physicist. Once he won his Nobel Prize at age 38 or so, he devoted the rest of his life to pedagogy, and he discovered through very rigorous research that the 50-minute lecture, the staple of the modern university, is probably the least efficient means of communicating information from one person to another that's ever been invented. Um, the, uh, but interrupting every six to 10 minutes, for whatever reason, you know, get up and stretch or it, 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 that even works, um, uh, actually improves retention. And in fact, he, proved, he showed that on a very large number of different types of samples, you've got a, a, essentially a doubling of, the, of retention through 50 minutes um, by interrupting things every six to 10 minutes. Um, so we do that on these courses. We, we, we provide all kinds of opportunity for student engagement. There's, 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 there's um, uh, self-graded assignments, I mean, there's machine-graded assignments so you get instant feedback that explain to you the wrong answers or, uh, you know, help you help you master stuff. If you fit it, if you listen, listen to a lecture segment, take an in-video quiz, get the wrong answer, you know, you can go back and watch the six minutes over again. It's not like being lost in the lecture hall. So there, in a lot of ways, the learning opportunity, learning experience for students is really, really really terrific in these um, in this newer version of the technology for online teaching and why is it you know why is this important I think um, it's really the, it's really the scale that's the, that's that's decisive um, to for me um, start with the fact that what universities like this one Hong Kong U or Yale or to, to mention a, a number of other Coursera partners like 
Princeton or University of Pennsylvania or Stanford, um, uh, have collections of faculty who are among the world's experts in their chosen subject matter. These are people who have devoted a lifetime to being masters of the subject. And, and the mission of the great research universities of the world is what? It's to advance knowledge through research and to disseminate it through publication and teaching. Right? Well, think about it. Our publications written are, are typically today written for narrow professional audiences, the specialists in our field, you know, and a good a good article, an important and witty contribution might be read by two or three hundred people. You know, um, that's that's your audience, the specialists around the world in your field. Maybe two thousand if you're in a big field, but not you know we're not talking about educating the masses through research publications. And then there's teaching. Okay, so maybe you teach one large lecture course a year of 100 or even 200 students and a number of smaller seminars. Maybe you reach two, 300 students a year. So let's say you teach at Yale for 30 years. I did this calculation for my next door neighbor, Bob Schiller, the Nobel laureate in economics. Over 32 years at Yale, Bob estimated that he taught 8,000 students. In his first Coursera course offered this spring, he had 160,000 students sign up. He had 20,000 students finish. Um, that's, that's, you know, more than double the number of students he taught in an entire career. So ask yourself, if the great universities are going to fulfill their mission of disseminating knowledge, look at this incredibly powerful new opportunity to do that. I mean, so to me, MOOCs are a truly transformative, revolutionary innovation in education because they're allowing the world's best experts, literally the world's best uh, scholars, <coughs> to reach audiences of you know hitherto unimagined proportion. We're going to educate millions of people with the best possible education in the world, and these are people from throughout life. This is not. We're not talking about disrupting the sector, it's not about six universities in the U.S. trying to make close all the other universities out of business. That's media hype and, non and nonsense. We're reaching, 70% of our audience is over 30. This is providing an opportunity for people throughout a lifetime to continue to remain engaged, keep their minds alive, to, 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 be, to be learning throughout a lifetime, and for people that need upgrades and skills as technology changes to upgrade those skills. Um, about half of our learners at Coursera are people looking for skill-related knowledge, either in business or in the information technology fields. That's about half. The other half are people who want to learn about Chinese philosophy or music or, or, or you know, uh, humanities or, or liberal arts courses um, for personal edification. Um, the courses are available for free. You pay only if you want a certificate that proves you completed the course successfully. Um, and you don't have to decide whether you want to pay the $50 until, you know, the very last day. So, um, you know, it's, we're, we're making available an unbelievably valuable resource to the world. And I, I think giving universities a chance to do so much more for social, you know, for social impact than they've ever been able to do before. So, uh, that's sort of, I, I'll stop there. That basically gives you the narrative of how I started with an interest in internationalizing um, one institution and have ended up in a position where I'm trying to enable um, the great institutions uh, of the world to, you know, democratize higher education. It's, it's, it's been an exciting journey. And I, have, I wanted to speak briefly and have a chance to engage with you and answer your questions. And feel free to talk about anything you know, whether it's Coursera or MOOCs or Yale or internationalization or U.S.-China relations, I'm open for your questions. Thanks. Yeah. I think they're recording it, so they want to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk, Professor Levine. Um, a question I have is related to the protests that are happening here in uh, Central because that's very relevant to our teaching situation. Students have been uh, missing courses and it's 
although we've tried to carry on as normal, it's been very difficult to, and I think students are going to be affected. And uh, I wonder what your comment would be on where this new student voice seems to have come from, because with our four-year curriculum, the aim, it seems to me, is that we're trying to, from you, produce more mature, holistic, critical sure. students mm. and people. And I'm wondering if uh, China, Hong Kong, Hong Kong EU are actually ready for this new kind of person, because it seems at the moment that this four-year curriculum ha has an impact that is quite disruptive. And oh. Hong Kong U obviously supports these students, but um, it's, it's great to have this new curriculum, and it's great to have this idealization of uh, an undergraduate who is able to voice, but now that they are actually voicing, it's causing a lot of disruption as well. And mm. I wonder what your comment would be on the new curriculum and how these, yeah. these young people are taking a place in society. Yeah, I, well, I... You, you all know more about what's happening in Hong Kong than I, so it's a little, I mean, but I have to say I'd be surprised if, 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 if the current protests are a direct result of your curriculum reform. It, 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 seems, it seems like a bit of a stretch to me. Um, uh, um, you know, stu um, student protest is, you know, been with us in modern society for, for a long time, and and even even in countries with a much less open educational system than 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 the U.S. has or Hong Kong has. Um, uh, so you know, I I am not sure. I, I'm just not sure. I see the coupling. Um, I mean, I I'm very I'm a large believer in educating the whole person and. The educating people in critical thinking skills because I think it makes them, you know, more robust human beings and gives them a capacity to appreciate life and to contribute to society uh, that far exceeds what they could do if all they did was master certain skills. So I, I, I wouldn't, I would be, I would really not recommend, you know, giving up on that mission because it's turned out that it's that, that there's been that, that there are you know that, that it's had a short-term disruptive um, consequence. Um, I think you know stu student activism comes and goes. I, I, I don't I don't actually know that much about the history of Hong Kong, but uh, in terms of student activism, but surely in the United States there have been waves and waves of student activism. There are periods where it gets very active for a few years and and quiets down. I happen to be educated in the, probably the most tumultuous period since the Second World War, the 1960s, and um, it, you know, it, uh, it, 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 I don't think the United States was particularly, I, I, you know, I don't think it did, there was a lot of long-term damage from the, from, the, from the period of student activism. I think there was some good and some ill, and that's probably going to happen in most societies. Oh, okay. Take your mic. Yeah. So, um, so I love Coursera, and I, I think it's portraying all the advantages you said, but could you play a little bit devil's advocate and talk a little bit about maybe some of the downsides? So, for example, what about, uh, could this lead to larger inequalities between the major research universities and maybe smaller universities that get left behind? Um, you know, that sort of, or, or, you know, what about, could this lead to maybe some universities justifying Cancelling certain courses because hey, you could take the, the equivalent course from Yale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, one way to think about it is um, not that this is destructive of what goes on in you know middle tier university, middle or lower tier universities, but it, it could be a huge added resource. You know, to, um, that is the ability to take. Um, video material produced by the world's leading universities, by leading scholars, and make use of it in your courses taught elsewhere. I mean, in that sense, think of these as visual textbooks. You know, that, I mean, we use textbooks authored by um, scholars, you know, from one place and use, it, use them around the world. So I think we'll see some of that. We're, there are schools experimenting 
with us right now. I mean, the University of Nebraska, the very course I described by my, my neighbor, Bob Schiller, is being taught this semester um, at uh, the University of Nebraska, basically, where the instructor is using Bob Schiller's lectures, you know, having students watch them outside class and come in, and then they come into class and, and discuss them. It gives, a, it gives an opportunity for the, for the instructor to have more personal interaction with the students. Um, so I think, I think that could be a positive. It's true, I think you're right, if you, if you if try to tr track this down for a period of years, you might find resource-constrained institutions deciding, yes, we can economize on faculty and import MOOCs to replace some of our faculty, and that could happen. Um, I think the power of the faculty guild is sort of sufficient that it will probably not, it won't happen very fast, but it could, but it could happen to some degree over time. And also, it's possible that in, in some of the skill-based areas, not so much in the liberal arts, but in, in some of the skill-based areas, you know, it could be that people would decide, I can get a good enough education online nearly for free, uh, that I'm, that I'm, um, I'm just going to learn, I'm going to take a bunch of computer school courses and basically go get a job. So, y yes, these things could happen, I'm, and I, you know, like any innovation that produces a lot of good, there's always some collateral consequences that may not be so good. So I, 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 I wouldn't deny their potential problems. My question is uh, kind of related. Um, in the history, for new technologies, you know, for example, radio television, or even say from 30 years ago, when right, internet technology became popular, well, people were saying, oh, this is going to revolutionize uh, education, and uh, right. students don't have to go to uh, school. But still, we are pretty much relying on face to face lecture yes. in university sections. So, what would make this run of uh, promises of aspirations different? Um, what do we need to do differently, or what, what are the differences that the groups uh, have so that we won't have another round of energy expectations? Well, that's a very good question. Um, and, and I think some of the early uh, hype in the media about MOOCs was of the, of the kind you described, that is, building up excessive expectations for what this can do. I don't think it's going to overturn you know, the, the system of in-residence, you know, um, close contact, face-to-face -face education. I think that would be, a, that would, I think that's just extremely unlikely. I think there's, there's so much that you cannot do online that in terms of um, the full experience that a student has of attending a particular institution where you're living in close proximity with other extremely talented individuals and learning as a as a cohort from one another. I mean, those things, those things are never going to quite be replicated. I think on, uh, on I won't say never, because one never knows. But they're not likely to re replicate it soon or by MOOCs. Uh, um, so yeah, one has to be wary of predicting, you know, radical change. And that's basically the point I was making in, rel in relation to how much displacement there be of traditional educational institutions. I mean, some. I, but I don't see it just stripping away the landscape like some of the, you know, some of the people writing about this, like Clay Christensen at Harvard, you know, is predicting, you know, that this, only a small number of universities will be left and they'll be teaching everybody. And I just don't, I just don't see that happening. Um, you know, people had very, uh, like you say, uh, I remember back in the 70s when Carnegie Mellon was doing all this work on program learning, uh, that that was going to replace teachers, you know, and, and it, it, it didn't. Uh, so, so you know we can we can we can exaggerate, and, uh, but I do think the, the point the, the the thing that does make this different is just already the widespread adoption. I mean the fact that 10 million people are registered users, of course, of Coursera, and that you know that um, uh, you know 100,000 people are completing cor uh, courses every month, and and. and um, it, you know, is, is is evidence that it is we are we are we're we're providing something at a scale that's you know unprecedented. And so that you know that and I and I think that will be durable. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, okay. uh, well, I have two questions. One is, 
what's the key difference between a student who's taking the um, Nobel laureate class um, in Yale compared to taking the same class um, online? So the MOOC student and, and the online student, what's the key difference? And then what is your, um, think, what is your expectation of where the MOOC um, development would go, say, in the next three to five years? Yeah, okay. So the key, so what the key difference between students taking the live class at Yale and the students online, I mean, demographically, obviously the key difference is the, the students at Yale are highly selective. You know, there are people in the top one-tenth of one percent in the you know, global IQ distribution, and so it's, it's, a, it's an unusually select group um, versus anybody who wants to. You know, at, so, uh, uh, take the course um, globally. So, I, I, to me, that, I, I see that as that, that's a difference that enriches. I mean, it, makes, it creates opportunity for lots of people. Um, the, the interesting question is, what's the difference in performance of these students in terms of what they learn? And while the evidence is so far very limited, there was one recent study of an MIT course taught on our competing platform, edX, that, um, that, uh, that was a, an elementary uh, uh, first-year physics course. It was offered to in-resident students at MIT. It was the lowest level introductory physics course taught at MIT, I'll say that first, but because they have many different levels. Um, but, but they actually measured the, the learning gains for the students at MIT and the students taking the course online, and there was no statistical difference. It, it was a really remarkable finding. That the, the online learners, you know, had had as learning gains as large as the as the MIT students, and even more interesting, when you looked at demographically the people um, learning online, the people from low income backgrounds did as well as the people from high income backgrounds. So that I mean that's actually great news. Um, now you could say okay, there's all kinds of self selection who chooses to take an online physics course, and that's right, but still it's a very encouraging. A very encouraging um, initial finding. Um, so where where are we going to be in three to five years? Um, you know, it's it, it, it's uh, I I, th I mean I think in three to five years there won't be a lot of revolution in the in the educational system, but I think there will be um, a continued pretty dramatic growth in the number of students to, to taking these courses. There'll certainly be a dramatic expansion of the number of courses and opportunities available online. If you think of it this way, most schools that have joined Coursera have, you know, the average number of courses per school so far online is maybe seven. So, uh, um, but you know, the average university of, <coughs> of, of this quality has, you know, two to 5,000 courses in there, in, you know, offered on campus. So the opportunity for many more courses to be made in MOOCs I think is substantial. So there'll be a lot more uh, options out there. There'll be a lot more students, um, I think. And I think the other thing that will happen is that um, my own view is that it'll prove itself to be sustainable. So one of the things that we that there's a lot of skepticism is can can some can a company like Coursera that's giving basically its product away for free can it, can it be financially sustainable? And, you know, you may think that by charging fifty dollars for a certificate and only, you know, one or two percent of the total number of students who sign up actually paying for these certificates, is that going to be viable? I think our scale will be large enough. There will be, and that and there'll, there'll be enough revenue that, um, that, that Coursera and undoubtedly some other competitors will will be able to succeed. Whoever, I'll, I'll let you guys pick whoever it is. <laughs> I think we've got the microphone. Right. I'll f follow up on Nancy's question. Uh, do you see any wash or any effect on the undergraduate teaching in Yale from staff engaging in teaching in MOOCs? And do you think engaging in these large courses will have an effect on the undergraduate pedagogy within our yeah. institutions? Um, yeah, I think I think there's definite feedback effects to, on the quality of in residence um, yeah. teaching from doing 
the MOOCs. For one thing, um, it makes instructors who make these, <laughs> I learned this actually back in 1974 when I, my first year of teaching, when I <clears throat> um, taped my, videotaped myself to see if I could learn anything. It's a, it's a terrifying experience. <laughs> and and um, um, then I had my TAs do it, and I, actually, I, and I gave them the option that they want me to come with them to hold their hand and calm them down when they see their video, or would they rather be so embarrassed they didn't want but the, But the basic point is um, the whole process of making uh, the course that it, it, this kind of highly produced course that you're then looking at and feeding back and improving it is educational in itself. That just the creation of the course is going to make you teach that course better the next time you do it live. One, two, the the data, the feedback from you know on such a larger scale that you can draw inferences so much more quickly. Um, so you get the real-time feedback, how are students doing on, on the questions that they answer on these quizzes. And you know, let's say you see that, that there's one multiple choice question where four choices and, the be and only 30% of the students get the right answer. So fairly different from random. So th that says one of two things. Either that's a very poorly phrased question, or the lecture that led up to it was really confusing, right? So, so that kind of feedback goes into, you know, better materials. Um, people go back and retake the segment, or if they're teaching it live, they'll, they'll get it better next time. So I think, the, I think both the process of doing it and the feedback one gets from this large sample of, of, of uh, learners can be, very, um, can be very helpful. And then there are, you know, about 15% of our professors um, actually you make the MOOC and then use it at, in a blended learning experience for their students on campus. So they'll actually assign students to go watch some of the videos rather than give a live lecture and then come in and talk about uh, the material in more informal ways. So, so this, is, this is your experience, not your speculation about that. Experience. This is all experience. Everything I've said, no, just you know, yeah, what I've said is, uh, is based on experience of our, of our instructors, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely helps. Um, uh, Professor Lovin, and there's a uh, follow-up questions kind of related to all the past questions. So uh, my impression is that the education at Yale, as well as HKU, is considered sort of an uh, elite piece of education. So through its uh, very highly selective admission process, only small percentage of students can receive these education and sort of give them a golden passport to propel them to future success. Well, what it looks is, uh, uh, Coursera is promoting is uh, liberating the education to everyone. So it seems that the university, supposing in the future, have to promote two kinds of education in opposite directions. So how do you foresee them to coexist coherently in the same places? <clears throat> yeah, well, <laughs> one impulse I, I always found with Yale students is, you know, don't give away the stuff you're giving, you know, you're, 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 the, 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 that, that's so valuable to us. But that, you know, to me that's understandable, but not commendable, uh, as a point of view. Um, the, um, look, the, the person who takes a Yale course online without the benefit of this highly selective bunch of classmates who you're living with in a dormitory and interacting with, you know, day and night, you're, you're not getting. You don't get you, taking the Yale course online is not the same experience as taking it at Yale, but it's still a very valuable experience. And I don't. To me, I think that you know the, the two can coexist. I mean, to be able to have this incredibly rich environment um, for on-campus students and to be able to share the benefit of the professor's knowledge and wisdom with the world, I, I, to me, it's just, you know, it's fantastic. I think it's a, it, it makes Yale a better place. It, make, it will make, if Hong Kong U decides to join for Sarah, it'll make Hong Kong U. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to Thanks for that very interesting talk. You mentioned in the, in the talk that the mission of the university is to disseminate all the true teaching and research. But the faculty uh, review system certainly uh, doesn't reflect that. Although uh, the 
all often mentioned that uh, we should put equal weight on teaching and research, but it's clear that uh, when it uh, comes to a faculty review, uh, the research part would be given a much more weight. And you mentioned that on the research side, uh, if you publish a paper, if you get uh, a few hundred or thousand uh, people reading your paper, that's considered high impact. Mm -hmm. Now, with the MOOC as a platform, it can reach thousands or even hundreds of thousands of students, mm -hmm. and you can now measure about the impact. Mm -hmm. And by uh, this publishing, teaching now on the MOOC platform, you could also have a uh, peer review mm -hmm. of your teaching. Yep. Do you think that could change the uh, faculty review system? And, and, and um, I, I think yeah. that is yeah. the real thing that you could change the behavior. Yeah. Of, uh, so, so, so that's a, that's a great question, and you know you uncovered my hidden agenda. <laughs> I, I, I I do think MOOCs are will change. Uh, if you ask what is that would be a question of the three to five year horizon won't get it, but if you have ten to twenty years. I think these rankings of universities will start to migrate away from pure research toward research and teaching because now you will be able to measure the global impact of teaching. And, and you're, there'll be object, there'll be third party measurement. I, I think there'll be an ecosystem of you know reviews of courses that, that will grow up organically. And I think it'll be great for higher education, actually, because it will put more pressure on on professors to be good teachers. And, and uh, so, so uh, yeah, I think it will, to some extent, redress the imbalance between research and teaching as part of our mission. And, you know, it's not, it's not the only reason to like MOOCs, but it's, it's another reason to like MOOCs. Um, can I ask you, Yale, of course, have very long experience of working in China, yeah. in China program, for example. Uh, you mentioned earlier today that, that uh, a couple of years ago, or a year and a half ago, you modified your, your um, the technical aspects of your platform in, in China, and the result was a quadrupling of the number of uh, mainland users of Coursera courses. Uh, edX, of which we're a member, of course, has a relatively small presence in mainland China. What would you be the main sort of takeaways from that experience over the last year of the quadrupling of the impact in mainland China? In terms of, one, the present patterns of behavior in China, vis-a-vis MOOCs, and your predictions for the next few years as to what will happen with MOOCs in China. I, this, I mentioned that at an earlier meeting, I mentioned that this very dramatic growth of our user base in China, when we improve the uh, performance of our of our of our site in, in you know by what we did is put we mirrored the videos <coughs> inside the firewall so that the, 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 the loading time and the speeds were better. Um, we're, that's only the tip of the iceberg. I mean, China's only eight percent of our global seven or eight percent of our global user base now. It, 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 it'll be twenty percent in no time. It's twenty percent of the world's population. So. So um, um, I, I think that um, you know I, when we are working on further improvements in our site performance and and in localizing more of the content. Since right now we're basically reaching mostly Chinese, well, not Chinese audience that is at least comfortable with English. Even the even the courses that are subtitled, the lectures have subtitles in Chinese. The web pages and all the you know are, are mostly in English. So so. What we're working on creating an entirely Chinese experience for the for the users, and I think that will have, yeah I think it'll have a huge impact. Um, and again, remember we're reaching more than just people who are currently in school. We're reaching all kinds of you know all kinds, all kinds of learners in China. So I, it's a key part of our strategy. I mean, China, frankly, and India, which where English language penetration is much higher, are both in, I think enormous potential markets. And where, where the need is huge for high quality education. So, are you mainly accessing the eastern coastal area with a few inroads into sort of Chengdu, Chongqing around there, or, or in terms of where you're hitting? That's a really, you know, I, I actually I haven't looked at the IP address. Do you know, Mari? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's still mostly the, the major cities. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've, but, you know, again, um, well, Actually, I, 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 I take, I'm not sure we have to qualify that because we don't, we can't tell where the mobile phones are 
Um, it, we, we only know the, the computer IP addresses. So what we do know is that since we created our mobile app a few months ago, we're already over 30% of the use in China. Maybe over 40% is on mobile. So we may be accessing the, the parts of the country that are not as connected to the high-speed internet. Well, okay. Well, um, well, welcome to Hong Kong. I'm, I'm from Yale as well, by the way. Uh, oh. We've met on campus before. Oh, great. <laughs> well, um, I um, agree with you on the learning experience about, you know, uh, living and learning with all these uh, uh, classrooms and all that, which cannot be replaceable um, with an online course. My question is, um, in your view, what type of courses that are more suitable or better positioned to be using an online channel for distribution as opposed to some other courses which should be better delivered in the classroom. For example, I'm, I'm from SOM. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the courses that, for example, strategy, uh, which requires a lot of interaction mm -hmm. with the classroom. Well, you can argue that if you have uh, the online course, you can have a computer, you can still interact with the classroom for located internationally. Yes. But that's different from face-to-face -face interaction. Yes. But other courses, like a mathematics course, physics course, maybe it's a totally lecture type. So, in your view, what sort of courses that are most yeah. suitable for online uh, education? Well, I think you're, 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 what you say is make, makes sense that, that certain materials um, that are traditionally taught directly by lecture um, are obviously the most easily adaptable to the, to the online format. Um, but, and so you might think that courses that are best taught in a discussion-oriented format are hard, you know, less likely to be successful. Now, that said, a, a, a clever and creative teacher can figure out ways to do things. So we have a course in modern poetry uh, taught by uh, Al Phil Reese at the University of Pennsylvania. And because he felt that for him to just get up, and, you know, just to sit, to, to talk and lecture about the interpretation of a poem Step, you know, non-stop. That isn't the way he taught at Penn. He would teach by, you know, reading a line and asking students what, what they thought, and then creating a discussion around around that interpretation. So he's actually doing the MOOC. It's an interesting MOOC because he, what he does is he sits around with four or five students and interacts with them on camera. So so you actually watch the interaction, and he, you watch him teach by drawing the students out and and, and interpreting what they say. So. Um, so, so there, you know, I think with, so I'm, I'm thinking of Sharon Oster teaching strategy um, uh, that way on, in a MOOC, and I think it's doable. You know, I think you, I think, I think, I think you could do it. It's just, it just would require a different, kind of different approach. As a, as a follow-on to that, do you see? Um, some of the large lectures breaking down into smaller precepts with, um, you know, 20 students offered with a TA, you know, in addition to the larger lecture? Class. Yeah, so that's, so down the road, yes, right now, we're, 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 you know, we're trying to develop the best platform, you know, in the world for large scale that can support large, a large user, user base. We're creating on our platform, we're in the process actually doing the software now to develop the capacity to create closed communities within this large open MOOC. And so that is part of our longer term strategy is that could you, can you create a kind of higher touch experience? We're committed to having the basic content for free. I mean, that's our, that, that's just the core commitment of the company that, that, that we're, we're about democratizing higher education and we're, we're, we want to deliver that. So we don't want to do but we, we, the idea that we might, for example, pay a, a premium price to have a, a closed experience where the professor perhaps even has a live video chat with, with 20 or 40 people once a week as, uh, as, as an enrichment of the experience. Yeah, well, I think we'll, I think we'll get there. Not this year, but soon. Yes. Uh, can you say a little bit about the financing model about Coursera, uh, how you finance in your operation? Um, uh, one related question is, uh, if one day your mark, you, you have, uh, say, one billion uh, students registered, you monopolize the market, will the financing model change? No longer free, 
no longer fifty dollars per fee, but uh, many university already start using your content. Uh, then you you know monopolize the market. Then the, how can we guarantee this is sustainable uh, for other for your users? Um, on your last point, if Google started charging you a hundred dollars a search, <laughs> no one would use Google anymore, right? So, so I mean, there, there's the entry, entry and exit barriers in the internet are so low that uh, the, the fear that we would capture the world's audience and then charge them a fortune. That's ridiculous. Somebody else will, will take the business. And universities that are our partners aren't committed to staying with us. I mean, our, our contracts with the universities are completely at will I mean, with the, you know, I don't know, 60 day termination notice. Or <laughs> so, I mean, basically, people can leave us. So, so we just want to be the best and do our mission. So we're not, we're not in the business of trying to lock people in and then gouge them. So, I mean, that's just not, that's not who we are or what we're after. Um, so, Forget about the sinister plots. How do we finance ourselves? We were fortunate that our, you know, our, our founders, Daphne Kohler and Andrew Ong, did a great job of raising um, initial capital, two, two rounds of, fund, of fundraising, that have given us a, a you know, substantial pool of funds to, to grow with. And with this model that we introduced about a little over a year ago, charging average price of about $50 for a certificate, we're, our revenue is growing. And uh, we envision that within a couple more years, you know, we sh we ought to be able to be break even. I don't know if it's two years or three years, but it's it, we, we, that we'll get there, and it will be self-sustaining <coughs> from that point on. So, um, and like and like as the previous question suggested, there there there'll be other uh, opportunities. I think as we grow, to find higher value-added services that we can tack on. But again. Not at, not at the expense of the, having the base layer of content available for free. I think the thing that makes this so exciting is, is precisely that. That's what we want. And that's why universities want to join. That's why professors want to do it. And, that, and, and, and that's, why we're, that's why we're there. That's, I mean, everybody who works there, it, it's amazing, actually, how mission-driven the whole team is. It's really, it's really, it's really fun to be part of. Yes? Um, I've got a question. Oh, maybe not. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Mike, somebody else. Maybe next. Yeah. Um, getting back to the issue of, uh, getting back to the issue of internationalization of Western education. Now, I think countries like China and Singapore, where they value about Western education, um, are things that they don't necessarily. Uh, I mean, you talk about the different values in different countries, but the issue of censorship. Um, is a big one, and I wonder how Yale dealt with it when they exported their education to Singapore or to China. Um, what was the strategy in dealing with censorship? Um, well, at it, 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 we, Yale, um, in Singapore, we, we negotiated with the government very clear boundaries so that, that um, I mean, there's unrestricted academic freedom on the campus. Um, there's no scrutiny of the content of the courses. Um, we, we, you know, we have, we're in, it's, it's independent and there's open discussion on the campus. There's, there's recognition that you're operating in a society where there are, where outside the, you know, it, it's, it, there, there are things that the government will withhold from public, you know, will not allow to be published in the country. And obviously, when you're in the country, that's going to be true for um, people at, uh, in, in, in Yale, Singapore as well. Now, that said, they're, 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 we, we've, met, we've managed, I think, very successfully to, to get access to materials. I mean, um, the, for our students and faculty, we've been able to get books that are not available for public distribution. We've been able to show films that are, that are not shown in public viewing spaces in Singapore. So, you know, we we as part of our arrangements, we've got a kind of oasis of of academic freedom operating. We really haven't had a problem in the two years we've been operating so far. Yeah. Hi. Oh. oh. Okay. Sorry. Hi. Um, I just have a follow-up question in in regard to the business model, right? 
Um, you know, I know you are, you know, getting up to profit, but um, I know if uh, Google charge a hundred dollar per search, nobody will use it. That's true. But what about the data? To, you know, in terms of learning analytics, right? Would you use the data that you collect in groups in order to generate, you know, any kind of income? Given that you are a for-profit organization, do you have any projection in that particular? Well, first, well, first of all, we, we don't. Well, the answer is we're not using the data for any sorts of uh, monetization opportunities. And what we are doing is sharing the data with our university partners for research purposes, and you know where, where we think it has uh, the most value. Um, yeah, I, you know, we're, we're I, you know, I, 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 I never, never even occurred to me that we'd sell the data to anybody. For, 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 but then we think that's because I'm green to silicon. <laughs> I think this gentleman is ready. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, my question has to do with the, um, uh, it's the, the Corsi, the Corsia? Corsia. 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 It's a very noble uh, concept and, and uh, uh, it's working. Uh, to some extent, but in terms of the number of uh, students that Corsica is attempting to uh, work with, you know, hundreds of thousands and so forth, now in terms of the grading system or the concept of how are all these students, you know, in terms of you offering these um, certificates, and so forth, they have to be a way of assessing and evaluating their work as well. I can't mention, you know, Nobel laureates grading every yes, paper, yeah. so there must be some sort of teaching assistance. So, yeah. how, how, is, how is that being um, managed um, in, in a quality control sort of way? Yeah. And um, and what about the issues of plagiarism as well? Okay, so the so the the, the assessments take a number of forms, um, multiple choice tests, short answer questions, computer programming assignments mathematical uh, expressions are all graded by machine so, so with instant feedback. So so a number of different assessment types that you, you put your answer in and you get feedback right away, all automatic. <clears throat> um, the question is what do you do with um, written longer you know, essays or spoken product? We have, pub we have a public speaking course where one mm -hmm. some of the assessments are based on your um, oral presentation. Um, what we found there is that with well-crafted rubrics with the instructors, with the teachers, you know, do, um, we can crowdsource the grading and we, we let the other students in the class grade their peers. Um, and it's actually, to, I, I, I mean, somewhat surprisingly, it's worked really well. The correlation between the grades that peers give to the assignments um, and what the professor would give are very high. And, um, and so in terms of how good is our assessment, I think it's pretty good. In terms of stopping cheating, um, uh, there are, uh, we, we use two methods. One, we use, a you know, you, you simply register for the course, you submit a photograph. And so we check who's, who's actually, when the set, when assessment is done, we actually use the web camera or the camera on the cell phone to basically verify <clears throat> that's the same person. And we also use keystroke analysis. It turns out, and I didn't know this before I got to Coursera, but people have distinctive patterns of, of typing and you, and you essentially have fingerprints. So, so you can uh, uh, you can, you can fed people that way. Now, this isn't foolproof. It's pretty good. It's not completely foolproof. I mean, there, there, you can imagine ways of getting around this, and and uh, and, and like you say, play all plagiarism, which is rampant on the internet anyway. We already know, even in I, I dare say places like Hong Kong and Yale, you do find students from time to time submitting essays that they have, um, you know, taken off the internet, and that that would be very hard to catch in the peer assessment framework. I think much harder than you know, we're pretty good at getting it in, uh, uh, in live universities. So it's not perfect. I think that um, I think that if there were higher stakes involved than getting the certificate, which you're paying fifty dollars, let's say for example, um, a, a, a university is going to give course credit for the work done in a MOOC. 
Um, I think you'd want to have probably in you know physical <coughs> testing on site with proctored exams yeah. to be more confident that you were getting you know um, cheap group results. So you know it's a problem, but not a big problem. Yeah. I'm afraid that we're out of time. I know there are many, many more questions out there, but please join me in thanking Rick. For